I'm not a linguist either. I can manage Jambo, uh, which for the Africans they know is praise God, but that's it. So here we are today. Well, today I felt led to speak of the importance of trusting God, especially at a challenging time such as we are currently living in. And I do so having proved the faithfulness of God at such a time as this. Because when I look around, I realize that unlike most of you, I've lived through a previous time of power cuts. In the early 1970s, I was working in London's West End by candlelight. Last month, people were worried, and rightly so, when the Bank of England's base rate was increased from 2.25%. But I remember in the 1970s, and Graham probably does as well, when it was as high as 17%. I also well remember the first run on a British bank for 150 years when on the 14th of September 2007, worried savers panicked and flocked to the branches of Northern Rock and withdrew £1 billion in a day. Now, I don't share these things to trivialise the present challenges we are facing. For who am I to disagree with our new Prime Minister? For he said this week we are facing a profound economic crisis. But just as God has been faithful in the past, I am confident he will continue to be faithful. Like many of you currently are currently experiencing, Dorothy and I have been through that life stage when the only family holiday we could afford was to camp and no further than Suffolk or Norfolk to keep the cost down. We've also known what it's like for our car to be beyond repair just at the time we bought our first house and we had insufficient savings to replace it. And when I gave up my banking career to lead the church that we'd started locally, we took a 50% pay cut. At the same time, our mortgage tripled and this coincided with the need to finance our eldest daughter through university. And I share these things to say this, that I can testify through all those challenging experiences as we continue to tithe and give that God faithfully provided for us. Of course, we've had to make wise financial decisions over the years, including getting rid of one of our cars at a particular time. But in sharing with you this morning, I'm going to share from King David's experience, but I do it with the fact that my own personal experience of also knowing of the importance of trusting God, especially at such a time as we are currently living in. In fact, it comes to me even now, I believe God would say to us, as he did at the time of Joshua, as I was, so I will be. As I was with Moses, so I will be, he said to Joshua. But this morning he's saying, as I have been with Roy and Dorothy, so I will be with you. And with you, young people, he will be with you. He never changes. He is a faithful God. The fact is, however, that we are living at a time where many people are finding things particularly challenging. World affairs are potentially troubling with Putin's escalating threats of using nuclear weapons and with energy supplies and food prices seriously affected by Russia's terrible invasion of Ukraine. It's also a time when the godly foundations of our own nation are under attack. It's not just the economic situation which affects us all personally, but also the overall state of affairs of our nation. If you wished to cause maximum damage to a building, and I haven't checked this out with any builder in the meeting, but I would suggest you would attack the foundations. And in a similar way, this seems to be the strategy of Satan with regards to our nat nation. In all kinds of ways, Satan is seeking to destroy the Christian foundations on which our nation has historically been built. For example, take the matter of respect for one another. It's sadly in decline with reported sexual offences in the year ended March this year up by 32%. 
In the past two weeks, the new Met police chief has concluded from the interim report of the Casey inquiry into his force that there are hundreds of racist, women-hating, corrupt officers in the Metropolitan Police Force who should be thrown out. That's not my words, that's the new chief's assessment. In recent weeks, news broke of a Christian primary school teacher who's been dismissed from her job simply for raising concerns about a distressed young child wanting to identify as the opposite gender. Our society is under attack in many ways. Sadly, the home for so many is no longer a place of security and refuge, but a battleground. Divorce is commonplace and children are growing up confused over their gender and identity. 42% of marriages end in divorce. And this doesn't include the number of breakups of cohabiting couples. God's word is clear. Psalm 127. That unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain. And yet our country has largely turned its back on God's standards and his way of building a healthy society. With same-sex marriage now accepted as the norm and reports of some schools teaching very young children that same-sex relations are a normal part of life. It seems to me that a prevailing spirit in our nation is what we think is perfectly okay, regardless of what God says. It's a time of rising price, prices when conventional marriage is being attacked like never before and when there's a troubling crisis surrounding agenda. It's a time when God and the authority of scriptures is being disregarded as Morris reminded us some weeks ago. It's a time for many of you when you're having to tighten your belt financially and trust God to bring you through what is a challenging time. And in addition to the economic challenges, I realize that some of you here this morning will be experiencing some personal challenges with regards to health, with regards to concerns for family members. For you personally, it might seem like there is no light at the end of the tunnel with regards to your present circumstances. But friends, like a tunnel, a storm doesn't last forever. And I want to urge you this morning to dare to believe that things will get better. In Psalm 27 and verse 13, David says that he would have despaired unless he had believed that he would yet see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That's in this life. Keep on believing for better. Don't allow yourself to get into a downward spiral of despair. God is a good God. Choose to believe that you'll yet see his goodness no matter what your present circumstances are. If your life seems to be falling apart, then as with a building, you need to check the foundations, friends. Remember Jesus' parable of the wise and foolish builders? Ensure that every aspect of your life is built on the principles of God's word. And that begins with trusting your life to Jesus Christ as the rock of your salvation and the foundation for a life of blessing and fulfillment. Then, when one of life's storms hits you, it may well be painful. You may struggle, but if you trust in him, I can vouch for the fact the Lord will bring you through the storm with a deeper confidence in him, the one who loves you and he desires the very best for you. What then, against that backdrop, does the Bible contain to help us at such a time as we're living in? Turn with me, if you will, or on whatever device you use, to Psalm 11. And the words will come up on the screens. Now, unusually, I want to read from two versions. Firstly, from the New International Version, and secondly, from the Living Bible Paraphrase. But firstly, Psalm 11 from the NIV Version. It says this. And this is David speaking. In the Lord I take refuge. How then can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? For look, 
The wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes the sons of men. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked and those who love violence, his soul hates. On the wicked, he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. And upright men will see his face. And the Living Bible paraphrase puts it like this. How dare you tell me? Flee to the mountains for safety when I'm trusting in the Lord. For the wicked have strung their bows, drawn their arrows tight against the bowstrings, and aimed from ambush at the people of God. Law and order have collapsed, we are told. What then can the righteous do but flee? But the Lord is still in his holy temple. He still rules from heaven. He closely watches everything that happens here on earth. He puts the righteous and the wicked to the test. He hates those loving violence. He will rain down fire and brimstone on the wicked and scorch them with his burning wind. For God is good and he loves goodness. The godly will see his face. Now, before we get into the detail of this psalm, Let's seek to establish the circumstances which led to David writing it. Whilst there is not complete agreement amongst Bible commentators as to the circumstances which David is referring to in this psalm, there is complete agreement that David, like us at the present time, was experiencing a particularly challenging time, both personally and in his nation. Commentators believe that this psalm is concerned with one or other of two challenging times in David's life. Some believe that David was referring to the time recorded in 1 Samuel in the Old Testament when David had to live as a fugitive because of the murderous hatred towards him from King Saul, which you might remember was filled by David's popularity in slaying Goliath. Other commentators, however, believe that it could speak of the circumstances which David found himself in when his own son Absalom had turned against his father and drawn many people to support him to become king. As a result, David and his household had to leave Jerusalem for their safety amidst concerns, in the words of 2 Samuel 15, that the city of Jerusalem would be put to the sword. Now, no matter which of these two occasions this psalm is speaking of, in both instances, the circumstances were both a challenging time for David personally and also for his nation. At the time of Saul, not only was David's life under threat, but also King Saul, the ruling monarch, was affected by demonic activity, which he'd opened the door to as a result of his uncontrolled, jealous anger towards David. The nation was being ruled by an unpredictable, unstable king who, in his obsession to kill David, did some terrible things, including the killing of 85 priests from the town of Nob. And as if that wasn't enough, he then went on to put the whole town to the sword. All the men, women, children, and their animals were killed, we're told, in 1 Samuel 22. It could therefore be that it was in that context that David wrote, when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? When the godly foundations of the nation are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The issue of when the ungodly seems to triumph is one which many have struggled to understand throughout history. You may also possibly do. Psalm 94, for example, is an appeal to the Lord as the judge of the earth to redress the wrongs perpetuated by arrogant and wicked men 
who occupy seats of power. The psalmist cries out to God, how long will the wicked be jubilant? If, as some other commentators believe, however, Psalm 11 refers to the circumstances faced by David at the time of his son's coup, then again, it wasn't just David who was in danger, but the nation was in danger of being taken over by a corrupt leader who was not God's choice. The godly foundations of the nation were in danger of being destroyed. Which begs the question, at such times, when everything seems to be stacked against God's people, then what can the righteous do? No matter which of these two occasions was the context for the writing of Psalm 11, not only were David's personal circumstances bad, but also the foundations of the nation were under attack and in danger of being destroyed. However, despite the seriousness of whichever of these two occasions David was facing at the time, this psalm reveals right from the very first verse David's utter confidence in God. And so, what can we learn from David to help us at this challenging time that we're living in? Firstly, when experiencing a very challenging time in his life, David's confidence was in the Lord. Verse 1 says, In the Lord I take refuge. The New King James Version puts it like this, In him I put my trust. In the midst of all that was happening in his own situation and in the life of the nation, David's confidence was in the Lord. He was David's refuge, his protection and security. David's trust was in the Lord. Friends, when things maybe seem to be crumbling around you in your situation, when the nation's foundations are under attack in so many ways, put your trust firmly in the Lord. He will not let you down. At a time of rising energy bills and mortgage rates, like David, our trust needs to be in the Lord. He is our refuge, and he has promised to be an ever-present help, especially in times of trouble. Because Jesus, God the Son, came as a man and lived in Palestine at a challenging time, a time when the country was under cruel Roman occupation with punishments like horrendous floggings and the death penalty by crucifixion. Because our God came in person at such a time as that, we do have a God who is able to sympathize with our human weaknesses and our struggles of living in a fallen world at a particularly challenging time. He's not remote. He knows what it's like to live in a fallen world at a challenging time. Now, where, how was it that David could be so confident? I believe that David's confidence is explained, at least in part, because he was convinced of three certainties which are referred to or at least alluded to in this psalm. David could be confident knowing, one, that God is sovereign, two, God is judge, and three, God is righteous. Firstly, God is sovereign. Look at verse 4. God says, sorry, David says with confidence, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. I think the Living Bible uh, paraphrase that I read says, the Lord is still on his throne. He's still reigning. We sang this morning about him reigning, didn't we? In the midst of everything going on in David's life and in his nation, David knew of a certainty that the Lord was still in charge. He was working out his purposes. As Psalm 2 verse 6 says, God has installed his king. Jesus is rolling from heaven's throne in our situation that we're facing today. Secondly, God is judge. In verses 4 through to 6, David points out that whilst the Lord sees and tests the righteous, 
He will judge the wicked. Verse 6 speaks of how the Lord will rain down fiery coals and burning sulfur, which in the scriptures is associated with judgment. Despite how things looked at the time, David is reassured that whilst the righteous get tested, the wicked will be judged. As righteous believers, friends, our lives will be tested for rewards in the next life, but we won't have to stand before the great white throne for judgment because those who are in Christ Jesus have already crossed from death to life. There now is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The phrase in Christ Jesus was the Apostle Paul's most used phrase to refer to the fact of being a born-again Christian believer. And if you don't know that experience, you can before you leave here this morning. You can have the confidence like David, I dare to say, like I have too. The certainty that God is judge means that ultimately the wicked will not triumph even though they may appear to in this fallen world. And thirdly, God is righteous. David was certain not only that God is judge, but that he is righteous. Righteousness is one of God's chief attributes revealed in the Scriptures. It's generally concerned with his ethical conduct. When, for example, in Genesis chapter 18, Abraham was visited by three visitors, either three angels or a pre-incarnation appearance of Christ, accompanied by two angels. Abraham's plea to God was based on the belief that the judge of all the earth would do the right thing with regards to judging Sodom and Gomorrah. Our God is a righteous judge. We can totally depend on his ethical conduct and on his moral standards of judgment. He is righteous in all of his ways. David says in another one of his Psalms, Psalm 145, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving to all he has made. He's loving to the wicked as well as to the righteous. He's loving to all he has made but he will judge the wicked. He will do it in mercy, but nonetheless, they will be punished. As recognized by David in verse 7 of Psalm 11, however, the upright, those who are made righteous through faith in Christ Jesus, we can look forward to seeing the Lord face to face. As Mark Altrock wrote in his great worship song years ago, he is beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words. And we're going to see him face to face. That's the hope we have, friends, as Christian believers. And that hope will not disappoint. Friends, when your world seems to be falling apart, hold on to David's certainty that one day you will see the Lord face to face, and there'll be no more mourning, crying or pain, for the present order of things will have passed away. No matter what we face in this life as believers, made righteous through Christ's shed blood, we can look forward to seeing his face. And then in the words of Mark Eltron's song, we will stand and stand in awe of him. And to quote another old gospel song, and the things of this earth, They'll pale into insignificance in the light of his glory and grace. Despite David's terrible circumstances, his confidence was in the Lord, in the knowledge of the certainties that God is sovereign, he is judge, and he is righteous. And friends, these truths can strengthen your confidence in the Lord, no matter what circumstances you are facing at the present time. With your confidence firmly in the Lord, Psalm 11, however, points to the need for each of us to make a determined commitment not to do three things. You thought there was going to be some alliteration. Here it comes. Not to flee, not to fear, and not to fret. We need to make a commitment, firstly, to determine with God's help that you will not flee that you won't give in 
to the problems you encounter, that you won't compromise your godly standards and convictions, but instead you will stand firm in the Christian faith, and as we're urged to do in Ephesians 6, you'll also stand firm against the evil powers that are against us. In Psalm 11, verse 1, David says to his well-meaning advisors, the Lord is my refuge, it is in him I trust, so how can I possibly say, how can you possibly say to me, flee like a bird to the mountain for safety? And in a similar way, if our confidence is in the Lord, then we can't retreat, but we must arise and stand firm in this day in our times of trouble, whether they be times of personal troubles or troubling times in our nation. Secondly, our commitment also needs to be that we won't fear. The circumstances spoken of in verse 2, within the words of the Amplified Version, the wicked operating in darkness, have all the potential for fear. But because David's confidence was in the Lord, he did not fear. In a similar way, we need to dispel fear with faith in God. In his word and in his promises. Friends, we're not just saved by faith, we're to live by faith. Things in our nation, things in your life are not out of control if you've given your life to Jesus. The Lord is at work. He is ruling from heaven's throne. Thirdly, we also need to commit not to fret, no matter what situation we find ourselves in. With the foundations of the nation being destroyed, as David speaks of in verse 3, there was a very real potential to fret. Now, to fret is to get disturbed or to worry. And even though we see the, nations of, uh, the foundations of our nation under attack and crumbling, we're not to fret or to worry, but we're to guard God's gift of peace and to press on and to persevere in the knowledge that perseverance produces godly character. We'll become more like Jesus as we press on. As I taught a couple of years ago here, Philippians 4 contains some keys to help us maintain our peace, including remembering that the Lord is returning soon. And when? As we've just seen from Psalm 11, when he does, we can look forward to the fact we'll see him face to face. And as the Living Bible says, if we live by the principles of Philippians 4, then you will experience in this life God's peace. When the foundations of our nation are under attack and in danger of being destroyed, friends, don't flee but stand firm. Don't fear, but trust God. And don't fret, but stay calm and press on. And also remember, else preach a couple of weeks ago from the book of Habakkuk. Don't despair in your circumstances, but instead choose to rejoice in the Lord. When Habakkuk learned that things were actually going to get even worse, with the ruthless Babylonians going to attack the nation, his determined confession in, in Habakkuk chapter 3 was to put it in plain language, no matter how bad things get, even if I've left with no animals for food and my fields don't produce any food, nevertheless, I will rejoice in the Lord and be joyful, watch for this, in God my Savior. It starts with God as your Savior. Then he says, the sovereign Lord is my strength. Habakkuk, you see, recognized the Lord is sovereign. He was and he still is in control. And Habakkuk also recognized that the Lord was the source of his strength, that if he responded aright, then the Lord would cause his feet to be like that of a deer which can ascend to the heights on rough terrain. And friends, if you, during a rough time, if you're having a rough time, if you want to ascend from the valley of despair to the heights of emotionally and spiritually, then praise and rejoice in the Lord, for praise not only affects your attitude, it also affects your altitude. It'll lift you up. You'll ascend to new spiritual and emotional heights as you praise the Lord and express your trust in Him. Don't despair. 
in your circumstances. But you might not be able to rejoice for them, but you can rejoice in the Lord in your circumstances. And finally, pray for our nation. For God has promised in 2 Chronicles 7.14, if his people, we can't expect the unsaved to do it. But God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Regardless of our political leanings, as believers, we're to pray for our nation, for our king and his government, to pray for peace in our nation, to pray for the advance of the gospel, for it's God's desire that all might be saved. And remember from last Sunday's preach, the importance of maintaining unity. For in addition to all those great things that Hugh shared last week, unity and agreement is also important in the matter of effective corporate prayer. At a challenging time, don't flee, don't fret, don't fear or despair, but instead trust in the Lord, rejoice in him and pray to him. And may I just say, as we draw to a close, I know that our elders want to encourage us at this particularly challenging time to be seeking to care and to support one another. And so if in the coming weeks you are experiencing financial difficulties with rising energy bills and food prices, then please do share your situation with your life group for prayer and for their support through what might be a difficult winter for many. It doesn't take away from the faithfulness of God what I'm saying. And if you're a church member, then you will have already received a video message from him in which he has encouraged you to let the elders know if you're struggling in that regard. You see, God's put us together as family. He's put us together as body. We don't have to walk through these things on our own. In fact, let's be people who get free from the British disease. Do you know what the British disease is? We can talk about everything but our own personal finances. Have you noticed that? In fact, I'll tell you what, we'll start this morning. If you are worrying or fearful about how you're going to manage financially, or if you're getting over anxious about world events or the state of our nation, I want to invite you right now. You're in a safe place. Just stand where you are so we can just stand with you and pray for you. If, if things I've said this morning have just touched on some things, just stand. If you're concerned, if you're worried, how are we going to manage? Mortgage is running off, fixed rate, whatever. Just stand where you are. There's no embarrassment. There's no embarrassment if you're worrying. Why would Jesus put teaching in the scripture and telling us how to overcome worry if, we, if he didn't know we would be prone that way? Just stand where you are right now. Just where you are. You're a faithful God. He's such a faithful God. He's your all-sufficient one. And I worship him. He'll be shalom, your peace. And your strong deliverer, I lift him up, because he's such a faithful God. We lift you up, faithful God. Lord, I pray right now for fresh faith to arise for any that are concerned about the time we are living in and facing at this time. I pray that fear will be dispelled 
in the name of Jesus. I pray that what the enemy would seek to use for harm at this time, that with your help we'll turn it for good as we watch for one another and care for one another. As we seek to embody the good God that you are. Thank you, Lord.